Oh, you believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Ramadan, it is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the series Ramadan A Date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host Yusuf Chambers and today we will discuss the topic acts permitted during the fast. Dr. Zakia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And how are you today? Alhamdulillah. Allah barik fi. MashaAllah. This topic leads to quite a lot of confusion amongst our community, especially from where I come from. Many people abstain from certain actions which we will find out today during the course of the show are sunnah and they are also recommended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, let's start with the question relating to one of those issues, I'm sure. The taking of a bath, bathing, sometimes it is taken, the bath, in order to cool the body down due to climatic conditions, and other times it is taken to remove sexual impurity. Is this a permitted act during the fast? Alhamdulillah. Was salat was salam ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajmain. Amma abad. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yisalli amri. Wahlu al-ugdat min laysan yafqaf qawli. As far as bathing is concerned, that is ghusl, whether it's done for a religious fard, if you are in the state of Junoon, that sexual defilement, or whether it is done to clean your body, to remove the dirt or you're feeling sticky, or whether bathing is done because you're feeling thirsty or you're feeling hot, whatever reason it's done for, as long as the person does not swallow water, the fast does not get invalidated. So bathing is permissible while fasting, and there are several ahadith to show that it's permitted. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, verse number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1926, that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she says that the Prophet, he got up from his sleep in a sexually defiled state, in the state of Junub, while he was fasting, and he took a bath, and he continued his fast. That means bathing was obligatory here because he had intercourse with the wife, so it was compulsory, and he bathed. Further, if you read Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2359, Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that he heard a man saying that when the Prophet had gone to Al Arj and while he was fasting, he poured water over his head. Because he was thirsty or he was feeling excessively hot. So even when you feel thirsty or you feel hot, you're allowed to pour water over your head or have a bath in the state of fasting. Furthermore, it's mentioned in Sayyid al-Bukhari, verse number three, in the book of fasting, chapter number 25. Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he soaked his garment in water 
and he wore it. In the same chapter, Sayyid al-Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, chapter number 25, it's mentioned that Anas man Allah be with him. He says he had a tub of water in which he used to sit while he used to fast. So all these hadith show us that taking guzul, pouring water over your head, whether it be for religious purpose, whether it's fard, whether it's optional muba, whether you're feeling excessively hot, whether you're feeling dirty, whether you're feeling thirsty, in the state of fasting, all these are permissible as long as you do not swallow water while having a bath. In the UK, Ramadan is about to enter the period of summer. And I know later on we'll be answering questions about Ramadan entering summer. The next question relates to a person that is swallowing his or her own saliva during the fast. Is this a permitted act? As far as swallowing the saliva is concerned, it is a normal act. It's a natural act. And today science tells us that there are several liters of saliva being secreted by the salivary gland every day. And it is normal, it's natural, that the saliva, a human being gulps it down, he swallows it, and this can't be avoided. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, when it tells you that you should fast for the full month of Ramadan, and those who are ill on a journey, they can make up the period later on, then it says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make it easy for you and does not want to put you in a difficulty. Allah says in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 78, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to give you hardship in your deen, in your religion. So, but natural sin swallowing saliva is a normal act. And I know that some people keep on frequently spitting out and I have some of my friends who do that thinking it's haram to swallow and they keep on spitting. And imagine if you have to do it the full day, you cannot even offer your salah properly. Because when you offer salah, it takes a few minutes. And in few minutes also saliva gets gathered. So will you be concentrating on spitting the saliva out? or on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. If you're reading the Quran, you'll have to keep on spitting outside, always. And I know some people who always keep uh, maybe a container, always spitting out, not knowing the ruling. So if a person swallows the saliva, normal saliva which comes in the mouth, it cannot be avoided at all. Same way a person, when he breathes the dust, which, which a person goes to a city which is polluted, and there's dust particles, and you breathe that, and some of it goes in your lungs, where it goes. So it's all this is permissible, because this is a normal day to react, and these do not violate your fast at all. What about cleaning the mouth and the nose with water, whilst one feels just like refreshing the mouth, um, or in the middle of wudu? Is this a permitted act? As far as putting water in the mouth, or gargling the mouth with water, or putting water in the nose, whether a person is feeling hot, or whether while doing wudu, it is permissible. Because it doesn't enter the body. As long as the water doesn't enter the body, a person does not swallow the water, it's permissible. And in wudu, gargling is a requirement, putting water in the mouth is a requirement. But natural doing wudu is fard, before offering salah. And while fasting, you have to offer salah, and you have to do wudu. So how can it be prohibited? So when a person puts water in his mouth while gargling, in wudu or otherwise, he should be careful that he does not swallow the water. And when he puts it into the nose, there are some people who think it will break the fast based on a hadith. And that is the reason they only touch the water to the tip of the nose. And they don't put it inside because of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2360, that the Prophet said, snuff water excessively while doing wudu, except while fasting. Mm -hmm. That means the Prophet recommended that you should snuff, put the water excessively in your nose, except while fasting, indicating that if the water goes through the nose, into your throat, into the stomach, it will break the fast. That doesn't mean putting water in the nose is prohibited. So normally when you put water, it doesn't go into your throat, and even if you snuff excessively, Always it doesn't go, it can go. So it's a precaution, the Prophet said, that don't snuff water excessively while fasting. Otherwise, you have to do that. So this hadith also proves that putting water in the nose, it is permitted. But you have to be careful, you should not snuff excessively so that it goes into the throat 
Otherwise, the water goes into the throat and the stomach, either via the mouth or the nose, it will break the fast. But unintentionally, while doing wudu or while gargling, if the water does enter, inshallah, Allah will not hold it responsible because it's done unintentionally. Okay, so it all goes back to the issue of intention. That's right. Pleasing Allah, seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'm aware in the uh, previous series, we've um, covered the next couple of questions. However, this uh, topic wouldn't be complete without some answers to the following questions. First one, if a person who's fasting eats or drinks during the fast, unintentionally, does this break his or her fast? When a person drinks or eats unintentionally because of forgetfulness, it does not break the fast. And this normally happens mainly in the first few days of the month of Ramadan. A person is used to his daily activity and suddenly Ramadan comes, so unintentionally he may go to the kitchen or he may pick up a bottle of water and pour it in the glass and have it. A person goes jogging and he comes back and he's used to having water. So it does happen. So based on the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1933, the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that anyone who eats or drinks unintentionally he has to complete the fast in the day. The fast is not broken. And whatever he has eaten or drunk, Allah has provided him with that. So if you drink unintentionally, the fast is not broken. But if you drink intentionally, then it is broken. And while drinking, if you realize, or while eating, you realize, immediately you should stop. Because then if you continue, it will be counted as though you're having it with intention. The moment you realize, you should stop it. And if there's some food in the mouth, and you realize you're fasting, you should spread it out. But unintentionally, whatever is done, it is forgiven. What about in the case of a person that eats it and then maybe 15, 20 minutes later, suddenly realize, you know, sometimes that, that has happened to me, uh, suddenly realize, oh, subhanallah, I've eaten something. What an idiot. <laughs> I mean, what's the... So then the hadith says that that food and drink, Allah has provided you with that. So to thank Allah. Oh, but wow. it should be unintentionally done and out of forgetfulness. Yes. If it's done intentionally, Allah knows your niyyah. Yes. So you can fool the people, but not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Jazakallah khair. Dr. Zakir, somebody is overcome with a sensation of nausea and they vomit during their fast. Does this nullify the fast? Is this something, can they resume their fast after the vomit has come out? Vomiting can either be intentionally or it can be unintentionally. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, it's mentioned in Tirmidhi, in the Book of Fasting, Hadith number 720. Our beloved Prophet said that a person who vomits unintentionally, he should complete his fast, and the fast is not broken. But the person who vomits intentionally, the person who vomits intentionally, deliberately, then the fast is broken, and he has to make up for the fast afterwards. And the same Hadith is repeated in Sunan Abu Dawud, Volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2374, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who vomits suddenly, same thing unintentionally, then he does not have to atone for it. But if someone vomits intentionally, deliberately, he has to atone for it. But the person who does it deliberately, for example, by sticking a finger in the throat, or by pressing the stomach, or deliberately smelling something which is nasty, or looking at food which will make him vomit, and he continues that, then it comes under the category deliberately done. So then his fast is broken, he has to make up for that. But if it comes unintentionally, no problem. But when the vomit comes, he should not swallow the vomit after it has reached the mouth. If he swallows the vomit after it reaches the mouth, it will nullify the fast. So when a vomit comes, he should see that the vomit comes out. And if it's unintentional, it will not break his fast. Thanks for that. That's, um very comprehensive. Dr. Zakia, I feel that the next question of all the questions that we've got to ask today will perhaps shock quite a few people. Um, the issue of a man and his wife, um, perhaps sitting on a sofa or some other place of comfort, and the husband delivers a kiss on the wife's face, let's say, for it, or the lips of the wife. Is this 
an action which nullifies the fast or is permitted? While fasting, if a husband kisses the wife or hugs the wife or shows his love for the wife by kissing on the cheek or the lip or the hand or hugs or embraces, all these things are permissible as long as it does not encourage him to go into an act which is haram for fasting. And this is very well stated in the Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1927, that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she says that the Prophet used to kiss and embrace his wives while fasting. But he was the best amongst you to control himself. That means the Prophet had the power to control. Similarly, it's mentioned in Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number two, hadith number 2379, that Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, once, while fasting, kisses his wife. Immediately, he feels sorry, and he goes to the Prophet, and he says that, O oh Prophet, I have sinned. I have sinned against you and Allah. So the Prophet says, that, what have you done? He says, that while fasting, I've kissed my wife. So the Prophet asked him, that when you gargle or rinse your mouth while doing wudu, does your fast break? So Umar may pleased with him. He said, no. So why bother? Indicating to him that you can kiss and embrace your wife. Furthermore, there's a hadith, which is mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, volume number two, hadith number 6739, one of the Sahaba, he narrates that a young man comes to Prophet Muhammad and asks him that can I kiss my wife while I'm fasting? The Prophet says, no. Later on, an old man comes to the Prophet and asks him that can I kiss my wife while fasting? And the Prophet says, yes. So the Sahaba look amongst themselves that how come the answer is differing? Then the Prophet replies that this man can control himself. So the basic ruling is that if a person knows that he can control himself after kissing or hugging his wife and is sure that it will not lead into an act which will nullify the fast, for example, it will not lead into a sexual intercourse or will not lead into ejaculation, as long as he can control himself, kissing and hugging is permitted. If he cannot control himself and he fears that he will go into the act which will nullify the fast, like intercourse or ejaculation, then it is prohibited for him. Hmm. So the answer is yes, but it comes with a, an Islamic health warning. That's right. Okay. The next question, which is not unrelated to the last one, um, can a man approach his wife during the month of Ramadan in the evening, after the fast had ended? Previously, when fasting became fard for the Muslims, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 85, that Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guide for humankind and giving you signs of guidance and judgment between right and wrong. And then it says that so whoever witnesses this month, he should fast. So when it became fard for the Muslim the first time initially, the full month of Ramadan, at that time it was the law that approaching your wives, having a sexual intercourse with your wife for the full month of Ramadan, whether it be day or night, was prohibited. And it's mentioned in the tafsir of Al Qurtubi, volume number two, page number 210, that Omar may Allah be pleased with him. Once he spends a lot of time with the Prophet and leaves the Prophet at night and comes to his house. And when he reaches the house, he has the urge to sleep with his wife and he has intercourse. When he gets up in the morning, he's ashamed and he goes to the Prophet and says that I've sinned against Allah and you. So the Prophet says, why? Because I slept with my wife. My soul urged and went towards my wife and I slept with her and had intercourse with her. The Prophet said, did you really do that? Hazrat Umar, Allah pleased with him, said, yes. And Hazrat Umar says that, can you find a pardon for me? And then Prophet Muhammad says, no one besides Allah can pardon you. He's the only one who can show you the way. 
And immediately the verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 187 was revealed. It says that you can approach your wives during the nights of the fast. Because they are your garments and you are their garments. And then the verse continues that, and Allah knows what you should do secretly in the nights with your wives. But Allah has forgiven you. And from now onwards, you can approach your wives. And you can take what Allah gives you the offspring from then. And you can eat and drink till the white thread of dawn is distinct from the black thread. And then you can fast until sunset, until night falls. So when this verse was revealed, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 187, then it became lawful for the Muslims to approach their wives during the nights of the fast. So now, as far as the present rule is, that you cannot approach your wives, have a sexual intercourse with them during the day, right from the break of dawn, from the time of Fajr Salah up to sunset. But immediately after sunset, up to just before the break of dawn, before Fajr Salah, you can approach your wife and it's lawful and you can have a relationship with them. Wonderful. Well, that was a reiteration as well because, of course, we covered that during the uh, history of fasting. Right. Um, however, it's good to um, reiterate it and uh, I don't think any point can be laboured in Islam, really. Another question for you is regarding a person who has a wet dream during the day whilst he's fasting. Is this an act which would nullify the fast? Is it permitted for a person to have a wet dream during the day whilst he's fasting? If a person has a wet dream during the day while having a fast, maybe your first Fajr Salah and he sleeps and he has a wet dream, it is involuntary. A person has a wet dream, even if he ejaculates. It's involuntary, he's not to be blamed for that. So in this case, because it's unintentional, surely it will not break the fast. And he can complete the fast and the thing that is advised to him is that he should have a ghusl, a bath, as soon as possible so that he can offer the salah. Ah, that's excellent. I think that's self-explanatory. Thank you for that. Another question, very much related to the last one, I feel. Um, is a person allowed to be in a state of sexual impurity whilst they're fasting? As far as the question that can a person be in a state of sexual impurity, that depends if as long as he does not do any haram act during the fast. For example, it's mentioned in the hadith of Muslim in Sahih Muslim, volume number two, hadith number 2453. It's mentioned that Umm Salma, may Allah be pleased with her, was the wife of the Prophet. She says that the Prophet got up from his sleep in a state of sexual defilement, state of sexual impurity, while he was fasting, and he had a bath, and he continued his fast. Further, there's a similar message given in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1925. And the hadith is narrated again by Umm Salma, may Allah be pleased with her, and Hazrat Naisha, may Allah be pleased with her too, both are the wives of the Prophet. And they said that the Prophet used to get up in the morning in a state of sexual defilement because he had intercourse with the wife not because of a sexual dream. And he used to have a bath. And he never used to compensate the fast later on. This proves that being in the state of junub, sexual defilement or sexual impurity, does not nullify the fast. Even if a person has a wet dream in between, his fast is valid. The only point to be noted is that the person should have a bath as soon as possible. If he gets up in the morning after dawn breaks, and if he's in a state of sexual impurity, should have a bath immediately so that he can offer the Salah of Fajr. Or if he sleeps after Fajr Salah and has a wet dream and then becomes sexually impure, so he should have a bath at least before the Zuhar Salah so that he can offer the Zuhar Salah after having a ghusl. Okay, that, I think that sheds some light on that issue. And the same thing if a person is menstruating, if a lady, if she's menstruating and she finishes the menstrual cycle just before Fajr and she delays a bath, even after dawn has broken, and she has a bath just before the Fajr Salah, that's also valid. Excellent. Next question relates to a woman who's cooking during the fast. Is she allowed to taste the food? As long as a person 
who's cooking the food, whether it be a gent cook or lady cook. There's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, chapter number 25. It says Ibn Abbas, he narrated that tasting food from the pots or meals, it does not break the fast. This is a Mu'alla hadith of Bukhari, but it is connected along with Sayyid Ibn Bishayba and Bihaqi, and the chain goes on. It makes it Sahih. And it says that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that tasting vinegar and food while fasting. So all these hadith prove that while fasting, a person can taste food, but you have to be careful. The food should not enter your throat. You should not swallow the food. And that is the reason the scholars say that if it's required, you should do it. Otherwise not. For example, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he says that tasting food is makhru, unless it's a necessity. Same with Sheikh ibn Taymiyyah. He says that it is makhru unless it's a necessity. And while it's a necessity if a woman is cooking food, she has to place the food on the tip of the tongue. So that she realizes whether the food is sweet or salty, and then she should spit it out. She should not swallow it. So that will not break her fast. Or if a mother wants to give food to the baby, and the only way she can give is by chewing it. So she's permitted to chew the food and then give it to the baby. But care should be taken that they should not swallow any particle of the food. She should spit it out. So these are necessities where it's permissible to taste food, but unnecessary. Just because you're feeling hungry and you taste it, it's makhru, though it will not break the fast. Makhru is discouraged. It will not break the fast. But otherwise, for a necessity, it can be done. But care should be taken. It does not go down the throat. It should not be swallowed. After tasting, the food should be spat out. OK, I'm glad that you... Uh corrected me in a way and said uh, we're not gender specific because of course we know that men do cook and they should be encouraged to do so as well. Dr. Zakir, relating to the application of al-kuhl or black eyeliner, as we know it is sunnah, it is a sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah bless him. Um, is it something which is permitted during the fast? As far as putting alcohol, in our country, India, it's called a surma, or a black eyeliner, it's sunnah of the Prophet. And we get in the hadith that Anas Mallah be pleased with him. He used to always stay with the Prophet. He used to cook his food also. And he used to put this alcohol. And Prophet never prohibited him, even when he put during fasting. So this proves that putting kohal does not break the fast. It is permitted. And even when you put any eye drops or ear drops, even if the ear drops or eye drops, after a certain time, you can feel the taste in the throat. According to most of the scholars, it does not invalidate the fast because that is not the normal passage of food. And eye drops, these are medicines, they aren't food. And there are times that because you know that having a medical doctor, the ears, nose, and throat, they're connected, known as ENT. ENT, ear, nose, throat. So when you put eye drops, even the ear drops, you know, nasal drops, there are chances after some time it may go into the throat, and you may feel the taste. If in the nasal drop, you should throw it out. But ear drops and eye drops, you feel the taste. According to most of the scholars, it does not break the fast. But there are some scholars who say that if it reaches the throat, it will nullify the fast. But the right ruling is, that because it's not the normal passage for food and drink, according to most of the scholars, it does not nullify the fast. And if someone who has a doubt, the best for him is, he delays putting those nasal drops after the sunset, so he's absolutely safe. But the right ruling is that even if you put a nasal drop or ear drop, it does not break the fast. Does the same apply for atar or perfume? You mean wearing perfume? Yes, wearing perfume. For instance, if you're going to apply perfume before or during the fast, is the ruling the same? If you wear a perfume and if you smell it, there's no problem at all. Smelling perfume is permitted. Any sort of perfume, as long as it is not an incense smoke. You know, you get smoke sticks, a lot of smoke that comes. Smelling that excessively, it may go in the nose, it may go in the stomach. 
in party case may go so that is a bukhur bukhur ah so that is what you should be careful of you know where otherwise smelling perfume it's permitted it will not break the fast the next question is regarding injections is it permitted during the fast as far as injections are concerned there are different types of injections it can be intravenous injection it can be intramuscular injection it can be subcutaneous injection but the injections can broadly be classified two types one type of injection which gives a person a nourishment which is equivalent to giving food for example if you take an intravenous glucose the people who have excessive dehydration etc and cannot take food by the mouth so normally the medical treatment is giving intravenous glucose this is sort of nourishment it is equivalent to giving food this will break the fast but if it's not a nourishment if it's only a medical treatment like insulin it can be subcutaneously or it is penicillin all these medical treatments which are not nourishment to the body are not somewhat like food these can be given during the day time and the fast will not break though there are some scholars who say that it's makru or discouraged it's preferable if it taken after the sunset but the right ruling is that it does not break the fast because it's not any sort of food okay in terms of uh, medical treatments um whilst one is fasting such as nasal drops sublingual tablets to be used under the tongue um or medical investigations where things are inserted into uh, your body are these things permitted during the fast there are a variety of treatments and investigations the list is long we can have a full episode on this time will not permit us to discuss all this i'll just mention a few which come to my mind as far as sublingual tablets are concerned they are normally taken for angina person has a heart problem he takes it this sublingual tablet is kept beneath the tongue it is not supposed to be swallowed and it is not a sort of food or nourishment it gets absorbed and the treatment is done so because of this ruling it does not break the fast you should not swallow the tablet it goes subcutaneously it gets absorbed without going to the throat if you use nasal drops as long as the nasal drop does not go to the throat and to the stomach it's permitted if you put ear drops also it's permitted as i mentioned earlier or if you syringe the ear even that's permitted as far as investigation is concerned if you do a per vaginal investigation whether you insert a finger or you insert an instrument it's permitted or for treatment if you insert a vaginal pessary or you insert a douche or any instruments it's permitted if you insert an instrument in the uterus or any device known as iud intrauterine device or you insert a catheter for investigation or a scope all these are permitted even if you insert in the urinary tract that is the urethra a catheter or inject a dye for doing an investigation it does not break the fast similarly if you take any injection as i mentioned earlier subcutaneous or intravenous or intramuscular as long as it is not a nourishment for the body it's no nutrient for the body it doesn't substitute the food it's permitted if it's a substitute it breaks the fast furthermore if you take a little bit blood from the body for testing that doesn't break the fast also and if you apply certain creams maybe cream or lotion or medical ointment on the skin and it gets absorbed by the skin this too does not break the fast and it is perfectly permitted and if you take other treatments like for example if you do a laparoscopy in which there is a small insertion made on the abdomen and insert a scope whether for investigation or whether for treatment or for a surgery it's permitted if you do a gastroscopy insert a scope into the stomach as long as you do not put in some fluids or some nourishment it's permitted for investigation if you put an instrument in the spinal cord to examine the spinal cord or to see how the brain is functioning all these are permitted if you do enema even that's permitted 
and you can go on and on as long as the basic rule is that it should not enter the body through the mouth or through the nose or it should not be a nourishment. Otherwise, if it enters any other part of the body, any instrument, whether it be the urethra, whether it be the uterus, whether it be the vagina, all these things, as a basic rule, it does not break the fast because it is not giving food to the body and this is not the normal passage for food for the body. All these are permitted. I think the fact that the other things are permitted will uh, put uh, a lot of people's minds at rest right. during this coming Ramadan and Ramadans Inshallah. to come, inshallah. inshallah. Dr. Zakir, what is the ruling regarding issues of doubt when one has doubts over concerns that they have, over things that they may be doing during the fast? What should one do? How can we apply a golden set of rules to the doubt? As far as when a person has a doubt to the act he's doing, is it permissible or not? Or if he has a doubt that it will break the fast. The best is, when in doubt, leave it out. When a doubt comes, the best is to abstain from it, lest it may have been prohibited. If it's a doubt and if you don't do it, then it will not be a sin. So it's preferable to stay away from it. But the best golden rule is, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 43, as well as Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7. First, Allah, Ahal Zikri in Kuntum La Talamu. If you don't know, ask the person who has the message. Ask the person who is knowledgeable, go and ask a scholar, and he will guide you whether it's permissible or not. That's the best. But till that time, when in doubt, leave it out is the best policy. Good advice. If a person, in the situation where one feels compulsed or forced into breaking the fast, or when one breaks it out of ignorance of a ruling, is it permissible that this person should be breaking their fast in such conditions? As a rule, whether the fast breaks or not, or is it permissible if someone is forced to break it out of ignorance, out of mistake, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 106, that after you have believed, and then if you go to unbelief, Unless it is out of compulsion. That means, even if you do shirk out of compulsion, as long as in your heart there is taqwa, fear of Allah, then it's permissible. So if someone forces you something which is not allowed and it breaks the fast, then you're not responsible for that. As far as the general ruling is concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, it's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number three, Hadith number 2043, as well as 2045, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has excused my ummah from mistakes, from forgetfulness, and from that which is forced on them. So besides force, even if it's a mistake, or if it is due to forgetfulness, Allah excuses that. And that's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 5, that if you do it, out of mistake and don't intend doing it, then Allah will forgive you. And Allah also mentioned in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 286, where we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Our Lord, please do not hold us responsible for our mistakes and forgetfulness. So basically, the things that break the fast, whether it be eating, drinking, intercourse, etc., all this, there are four criteria to be looked into. If it's done, by force, under compulsion, then you're not responsible. If someone forces something on you, you aren't responsible. Allah will hold you responsible. Number two, if it is done out of mistake, for example, a person, he has suhur, and he thinks yet dawn hasn't come, and he continues eating. It's a mistake. The moment he realizes, he stops eating. So that's a mistake which Allah will forgive. Or, someone does something out of forgetfulness, like a person eats or drinks water while fasting unintentionally, out of forgetfulness, then Allah forgives you and the fast is valid. And the fourth thing is that if he does out of ignorance because he was not aware of it. For example, if a person doesn't know that vomiting deliberately, vomiting intentionally breaks the fast 
and because he has uneasiness and he puts a finger in his throat and vomits out, then it is out of ignorance of the ruling. Even that Allah will forgive, inshallah. So these four categories, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to overburden us, and a prophet said that if these are the case out of ignorance, out of mistake, out of forgetfulness, if someone has a compulsion, all these things, inshallah, Allah will forgive you. And that is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Dr. Zakir, it's clear to me, and I'm sure it's clear to the viewers, that Allah's mercy overcomes his wrath. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Well, we've come to the end of the interview stage. Now, I'd like to um, turn to our viewers' questions Inshallah. on the topic. Inshallah. So, without further ado, I have a question from one of the viewers. If a person is suffering from asthma, um, can he or she utilize using treatments like oxygen vaporizers and other oral tablets? As far as a person who's taking treatment for asthma, there are different types of treatments taken for persons suffering from asthma. It can be puffers, it can be oxygen, it can be vaporizers, it can be tablets and capsules. In short, when a person uses a puffer, the gas goes by force into the lungs, expands the lung. And in no way does it break the fast because it's mere gas going to the lungs. It's not a food. It doesn't go into the stomach. And it's only gas, so it does not break the fast if a person uses a puffer. As far as oxygen is concerned, that too, it's inhaled, goes in the lungs, comes out. So oxygen per se also does not break the fast, does not invalidate the fast. But as far as vaporizers are concerned, vaporizers can be of different types, can be in form of liquid, can be gaseous, in form of particles. And this medicine is put in a container. And once the button is pressed, the pressure which comes, and by pressure, it enters into the lungs. And it may be through a nozzle, can be through a mask. But when it enters the lungs, there are high chances that there are particles which may even go into the stomach. So that's the reason most of the scholars say that vaporizers as a treatment for asthma, it will break the fast. As far as capsules are concerned, the capsules, they contain the medicine in the form of a powder. It has a covering. Once you put in the container, and when the pressure is released, it comes out by force. But this too can enter the stomach, the particles. So even using these capsules as a treatment of asthma, it will surely break the fast. So only two things which are permitted as far as the person suffering from the disease of asthma is puffers and oxygen. This will not break the fast. Another question from one of our viewers. Is it permissible to use toothpaste whilst fasting? As far as using toothpaste is concerned, most of the scholars say that using toothpaste is permissible, including Sheikh bin Baz. May Allah have mercy on him. He says that using toothpaste along with toothbrush is like using sewak. And the Prophet has never prohibited using sewak. It's perfectly all right. It doesn't break the fast. But it will be careful that you should not swallow any of it. So swallowing any part of the toothpaste is forbidden. That there is in some scholars say it's makhru thinking, oh, if someone has toothpaste, it has a strong taste and someone will swallow. So that is the reason some say it's discouraged. But the right ruling is that as long as you're careful that you don't swallow any part of it. You can use a toothpaste and a toothbrush. It does not nullify your fast. Okay, excellent. Next question from the viewers. Should a person spit having rinsed or washed his mouth out generally or after making wudu? Normally when people fast, there are some people who think that after you gargle your mouth with water or rinse your mouth with water, then they should spit out because, you know, maybe some water will be followed. But the general ruling is that most of the scholars agree that once you gargle the mouth, and after expulsion of the water from the mouth, there's no need to spit. It's not a requirement. And even those few scholars who say you should spit, it's only once. But there are some people who spit several times. Some people even take a cloth and they dry their mouth, you know, after gargling thinking that the water will, you know, go into the stomach, which is absurd. Because normally when we see and we read the seed of the Prophet and the lifestyle of the Sahabas, many a times when they drank water just before Fajr, 
before beginning the fast, when they heard the Fajr Azan, they stopped drinking. But we have never heard of any Sahaba spitting out after drinking water. If you have to spit while gargling, the people when they have water just before starting the fast at the end of the sore, when they heard the Azan, surely some Hadith would have said that the Sahaba, they spat. You know, so that the water doesn't go into, which is not seen. And while doing wudu, when you gargle the mouth, rinse the mouth, and you expel the water, that's it. Even if you have to spit maximum, I think once is sufficient. You can't go beyond that spitting several times and, you know, taking a cloth and drying your mouth. Everything else that remains can be counted as part of the saliva. There's no problem at all. You can't make life difficult for you. It's good to know that, actually. It made life very difficult when one was fasting, if we had to do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakir. Indeed, Dr. Zakir and I, we have reached the end of the show, and I must say that I am surprised that the number of acts which are permitted... You know, it's often the case that you feel, when you're mixing with the brothers and sisters, Islam is all about no, no, no. It's actually about yes, yes, yes. Alhamdulillah. I'm so Only glad. a few knows knows. A few no knows. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, it's been enlightening and very enjoyable as well, I must say. Brothers and sisters, I'm sure that you will agree with me. And I request you, once again, to encourage your friends, even if they are brothers and sisters in humanity as opposed to in Islam, to join us tomorrow at the same time when we will be discussing acts recommended and discouraged whilst fasting. So do join us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. حافظين ذاكرين قانتين خاشعين مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صوم وعتق وقنوت فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهلت بالصيام وأقل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتهو في كل في